up back at Exodus. Um, here we go. All right? Okay. Welcome. And uh, we're, we're coming back to a part of uh, the Bible that we, we touched on a few weeks ago before we got involved with Carl Jung. Exodus. Now, when, if I stand up here, and you, you, you're kind enough to come and, and share these things with me, I am not going to stand here and insult my intelligence or insult your intelligence by telling you about 40,000 people trying to find a, a street somewhere and wandering for 40 years looking for it. I mean, when you hear that there are thousands of people wandering across the desert for 40 years, I, not 40 days, 40 years looking for a street or some place and I can't find it, then you know there's some, somebody trying to tell you something. In this particular context of, you know, of an idea, we, we have to go right back to the very basis of our foundation of our religious beliefs in, our, in this country, in the countries all over the world. I mean, you're raised... I mean, you're, I don't know where you each went to school, but most of you are fairly intelligent. I consider myself fairly intelligent. You people, we have all been raised. Like, there's a lady here that's, that was telling um, Vinny, she couldn't believe I talked the way I did. We have been raised by our culture to believe that our problems are caused by devils. Devils. That's the cause of our problem. And we don't refute that. I mean, churches are packed all over the place, and that's the foundation of their teaching, that your problems are caused by devils. And that in order to get back at the devil, we have a God who is really a smart guy. He knows how to do it. He'll kill his son. That'll take care of it. We don't have a question. Oh, that sounds good to me. Praise God. Thank you for killing him. Why'd you kill him? Well, I, uh, why? No, it doesn't make any sense. And the reason all of this is taught to us it then brings us into these big places where somebody teaches us that our salvation from devils comes through them. That they're going to, you know, guide us to the point of being saved from devils. We never stop to think. You know, you're, you're mature people. You went to school. Many of you went to college. That the only devils that exist are in our head. And that they're our own thoughts. And no devil makes you do anything. You do things because you want to. And you enjoy it. And it doesn't make any difference even if it's scuzzy. You still do it because you want to and you enjoy it. It's nothing to do with the devil. But when do we mature? But you see, the problem is, if we stop believing in devils, then we have to take responsibility. And we don't want to do that. And so we don't take responsibility for the things that go wrong. We blame it on the devil. We're not going to certainly take responsibility for lifting ourselves out of it so you know we and we don't feel we're capable we're told you're told all of your life that you're not capable that you know all of your righteousness is like a filthy rags and you're all sinners there's not one who is clean and so and so you reach that point of saying well i guess so so we need we need a savior so we got to we got a hero we could create jesus and we create a crucifixion and we create a crucifixion is it anything new i mean is this clever did we originate this no this was originated by the fact that the sun on December the 21st, the shortest day of the year, goes through a constellation called Crooks, which means cross. So we take that and we create a story around it. As I told you on December the 21st, if the sun went through Taurus, we would have rewritten the story and Jesus would have been gored to death by a bull. So we create all of these things. They don't work. The world is, is, a, is a brutalized, savage place. And it's okay. I mean, we don't, we don't stop for a moment to question, is any of this stuff right? I mean, it, could it possibly be that maybe we have been believing in some types of fables? Maybe we're taking some types of myths, literally, and as a result of this, we find ourselves with no idea of what to do. We have no idea at all of what to do. And you've been reduced to coming down to the cellar of Vito's shopping center listening to me to try to figure out what the heck to do. Because you don't know. Nobody knows. But you do know one thing. You do know that it's very violent out there. It's very competitive out there. It's the source of great sickness and disease and all of this stuff out there. What have we talked For four years in this room, we've been telling people that the pineal gland of the brain secretes a hormone called melatonin, 
We've told people that Jesus spoke about it, Jacob spoke about it, Osiris spoke about it, Rene Descartes spoke about it. This melatonin is supposed to be able to cure cancer and do all of these things. Now, all of a sudden, four years later, there's people selling it in the health food store. It's in Newsweek magazine. It's on CBS radio. And somebody go up to you and say, I can't believe he says these things. Because they never have said them. Because they don't know this. And you've been deprived of knowing what your own body does to cure you, to heal you, to make you wiser, to give you understanding, because religion won't allow you to know. And the reason religion does not want you to know this is because once you know that God is inside of you, what do you need them for? And them, they exist for one purpose, to control to control. And that's why I love Carl Jung so much, because Carl Jung said that the devastation that comes upon the human race is that they allow themselves to be controlled. You allow yourselves to be controlled by, by those of your family. You allow yourselves to be controlled by your school. You allow yourselves to be controlled by politicians. We are, look, look at these bizarre people, what they've done. They're, they're going to take money away from Medicare and Medicaid and welfare and all these. They're going to take money away from poor people, and they just gave the cable companies a right to raise their rates. And, and not only that, I wouldn't be so basic. That's awful. These are bad people. You elected them. <laughs> and and, and after, after they get done and they'll screw this up, we'll get other people and we'll elect them. And they'll come around and do that and then they'll screw up and, we'll, and it goes on and on and on and on and on and on because we're part of a mob. We're part of a gang and we can't individuate, we've got to think for ourselves. So I come to the point in the book of Exodus, and I'm going to talk about 40,000 Jews traveling across the desert looking for some town and they can't find it, and they're out there for 40 years. <laughs> 40 years and they can't find it. Imagine a guy starts 25 years old, he's out there, he said, listen, can you tell me I'm looking for Birdville, uh, I don't know. Ten years later, he's 35 years old, still out looking for the same town. Now he's 45. He's been there 20 years looking. I mean, can't somebody say, hey, the sun rises in the east, let's go that way. So eventually you're going to come to the ocean. I mean, it has to be. You're going to come to something. And so, what are we looking at here? We're looking at a beautiful thing called allegory. Allegory is a story that takes the premise of a historical story, but it's actually a symbolic story. Folks, are you going to sit and think for a moment that there is some guy called God who lives on a planet somewhere and who's trying to figure out how to forgive you for smoking? Or maybe he heard you went down to the Taj Mahal the other night and played the slots? Or maybe... Some other things that you, he's got to forgive you. And so in order to forgive you, he's going to torture somebody to death. This is great. It's our heavenly father. Going to kill somebody. And then he's not going to come down and kill this guy by himself. He's going to use hit men to do the killing. And then he goes, Jesus, they don't know what they're doing. Of course they do. They didn't know they were killing God. And after this, he's going to send people to hell that don't do what he, and have people jab you with pitchforks while you sit in a frying pan forever. And he's going to finalize all of this wonderful love that he's involved in by causing Armageddon and blowing the whole blasted thing to pieces. And you're going to come to church and say, thank you, Lord, for loving me. Get out of here. The guy's a maniac. What are you talking <laughs> Good part is that's not what God is. The good part about it is that we have been following the God that has been created for us by religion, which has no relationship to that which is God. God is the manatee who's swimming up from Florida. God is the dolphin who leaps in the ocean. God is a pussycat. God is a little puppy dog. God is a little child. God is the wind in the willows. God is the stars in the sky. God is the beauty. God is the pineal gland sitting there, totally neglected, ready to pour forth melatonin and make you younger and make you heal and make you feel better and make you understand, which is totally neglected. All of these things are what God is. But we have allowed religion to create us this God of violence and retribution and destruction. Now, if we're going to have an exodus, we're going to come out of Egypt. We're going to come across the desert. We're going to come to the Red Sea. We're going to cross the Red Sea. We're going to head to the Promised Land. It never happened. 
It never, ever happened because it's allegory. Look up allegory when you get home, but let me show you something. Go to page 953 of the Bible. 953. Real quick. Here's the Apostle Paul talking about an Old Testament story. Do you remember when Abraham's wife got pregnant when she was 103? Would that be something for your Heavenly Father to pull on somebody? <laughs> Hi, Maud! Hey, guess what, Abe? <laughs> oh, God. No wonder Abraham went out. He's going to kill everybody. He's going to kill you. What are you talking about? You're 104. Hey, I know. I'm going to have a shower. Yeah, jeez. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> But you know the, the other point is, you, 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 you would never ever think of not taking that literally. I, I mean, you know, go to the Garden of Eden. What do you got? Two people running around with no clothes on. This lady had no panties on. This guy had no shorts on. And they didn't know it. But they found out. You know how they found out they didn't have any, any clothes on? They, they ran into a talking snake. And the talking snake said, hey, uh, what's that? I don't, you better get your shorts on there, fella. <laughs> but when we're laughing, we're laughing at ourselves, folks. This is the basis. This is the foundation of our culture. We believe this. So God comes down and says, I, um, who told you you didn't have any panties on? <laughs> the talking snake. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, he would know. Right, now, nobody ever questions this. Had anybody ever thought, did they ever tell you whatever college you went to or school that snakes don't talk? <laughs> snakes do not talk. I know it's blasphemy. <laughs> Nonetheless, let me assure you. Here's a guy who's on a boat, falls overboard, gets swallowed by a fish, lives in the fish's intestines for three days. It's a vital part of your culture. He's in the fish's intestines. The fish is out eating all other kinds of junk, and this guy's living in there for three days. <laughs> Gets up, brushes his teeth in the morning, you know. Every time the fish opens his mouth, you know, it's like turning the light on in the refrigerator. What, these guy's in there. What is this? The fish pukes. After three days, the fish pukes, and an evangelist pops out. <laughs> Repent! That sounds, nobody ever questions it. It's all right to me. I like that. Let's all sing and sing just a closer walk with thee. I don't want to get anywhere near these people. Would you want to get near this? <laughs> Jesus. And if you, if you question this, you know, this is an amazing part. If you question this, you're saying, oh, why does he say these things? Because fish cannot swallow people. Because snakes don't talk. Donkeys don't talk. And all these things, are, these are, look. You, did you open to page 953? You're at Galatians chapter 4. Look at verse 25. This is the Apostle Paul. Which things are in allegory? Okay. Now, if that's what it says, that's what it says. It's, it's an allegory. And if I've got all of these people wandering around in the desert, I've got to find out. We've left Egypt. We come across the desert. We come to the Red Sea, back across the desert, we're trying to get to the Promised Land. Now we've, we realize this is allegory, we realize no such thing like this ever happened. But there is a place where you are not respected for what you do, you work your tail off and it just piles up more and more on you and you never get anywhere and nobody ever thinks that you know what you're doing, you're not allowed to say anything, you're not allowed to do it, you're just about to do what you're told and you've got to get out of here. And you get to a point of confusion, and then your emotions start driving you nuts until finally you break across and you start heading in this direction. Now, the point is, when we're talking about Egypt, and we're talking about the desert, and we're talking about the Red Sea, and then we're talking about heading to the Promised Land, we've got to, in order to, if we're going to discuss it, locate it. We've got to use a map. Anybody ever seen a map of this area of the world? Okay. If you would take your left hand, right now we'll place our hand on Egypt. Do you have a left hand? Anybody have one? Would you follow it with me? Place it right here. That's Egypt. Right here. Put your hand right here. That's Egypt. 
Move with me a little bit this way. This is the desert. A little further, you've reached the Red Sea by the pineal gland in the center. Come over, cross over the desert. Now take your right hand, put it over here. It's the Garden of Eden. That's the Garden of Eden. That's the place where the tree of life. And that's the struggle. You're trying to get out of all of the bondages, all of the hurts, all of the guilt, all of the fear, all of the torture, all of the sickness that has been drummed into you on this side. Follow it across the desert of your meditation, across the emotions raging within you, back across this desert of meditation until finally you can get to the promised land. When you crossed the Red Sea, you didn't get to the promised land. All you knew for sure is that you're heading in the right direction. And I'll tell you something, that's why you're sitting here. You haven't reached the promised land, but you do know that you're heading in the right direction because there's no fear taught here. There's no guilt taught here. There's no hate taught here. There's no war taught here. There's no vengeful God taught here. So you must be heading in the right direction. So you've pulled through your meditation, and that's why it is so important, and that's what happens, and that's what this whole story, this whole story has nothing to do about people who are traveling across the desert and the wilderness. Forget that. It's talking about this pathway here, right here, from here to here. Energy. Moving from the left to the right. Go to page 60. And page 60 you get in the book of Exodus, and in Exodus chapter 15. Page 60, Exodus chapter 15. And look at verse 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out from the wilderness, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now Moses does not exist. But Moses does exist, because Moses is that part within you that says, we've got to go. Moses is that part in you that has caused you to sit in this room today because you say, this isn't right. We can't stay here. I can't con continue to be thinking the way I'm thinking. I can't continue to feel the way I feel. I've got to move. I've got to go. And so the Moses that is within you says, ho, let's go. John Wayne, we're going across the desert. And so you move out from the bondage of the left side. And what does that mean? You are no longer going to pay attention to Pharaoh. You are no longer going to pay attention to the Catholics or the Baptists or the Methodists or the Hindus or the Buddhists. You're going to pay attention to a whole new thing that's within you. You're moving in a whole new direction. You're leaving Egypt. You're no longer going to be this patriotic. You're no longer going to salute this flag. You're going to move in a whole direction that's a universal. You're going to start taking your instructions from within. You're going to start taking your instructions from the stars, you're going to start taking your instructions from the very essence of life, which is nature. You've left Egypt, and Moses says, let's go. Then you get out into the wilderness, and you cross the Red Sea, which is your emotions. And when your emotions are pounding you, trying to drag you back to the old way, Moses looks up in the sea parts, and you cross it, and now you're on your way back into the desert, heading towards the promised land, and that's where you're at. That's where you're at if you want to be. But you can turn around any time you want and go right back to the same lunacy, to the same hate, and to the same guilt, and to the same fear. And that's what people are doing today. You know why, you know why the stores are selling out of melatonin all over the country because of the Newsweek article? You know why you can't buy any in the stores? Because people do not know that the very scriptures that they carry under their arms say to you that if you will sit in the darkness of meditation, it will flow. That Jesus Christ said, if your eye be single, your body will fill with light. They don't know that. So they go to the store to buy it. So we're heading in the right direction. In the wilderness, we're still in the confusion, and you know that even though you've crossed the Red Sea, you know that what happens to you. No matter what you do in your journey, you've meditated Tuesday night, and Wednesday you got ambushed. Boom! Somebody shot at you. Something happened within you Wednesday. Something happened Thursday. Something happened on the job. Something happened in the house. Something happened, and you had a, you had a skirmish. You had a fight. You had, a, you, had a, you had an attack somewhere within you. But there is something that this scripture says that tells you right away something good's going to happen. There's going to be a change. Exodus 15, right where you are. Moses brought, and they went out from the wilderness of Shur. Do you see that? And they went how many days? Three. The number three means new life. The number three means that which is old is going to pass away, and something new is going to happen. 
You have to understand metaphysics, you have to understand numerology and understand this, but that's what it means. Why does the number three mean that? Is there any basis in science for that? Yes. On December the 21st, the sun goes to the cross. It's crucified. It's the shortest day of the year. On December the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, the sun sits in the tomb of the earth. It's called the winter solstice. The sun sits there, the darkest days of the earth. On December the 25th, the sun is reborn, and from that day on, the darkness grows shorter. Every day grows longer. There's more light, there's more light, there's more light, because the sun is born out of the winter solstice. The number three signifies the three days and three nights of the winter solstice, that there is the end of the downward pull, and here is the beginning of the upward pull. Here is the end of the involution. Here is the beginning of the evolution. Here is the end of the winter of your life. Here is the beginning of the spring of your life, because the energy is starting to rise. The fire is starting to come up from the solar plexus to hit the pine cone, explode the pine cone of seeds of new life into your brain, and you start thinking differently. And if you don't believe me, and you can't, how are you going to come down in a basement of some shopping center in Fork and River and believe me? That's ridiculous. I understand that. But certainly Newsweek wouldn't lie. <laughs> so, there it is. So, right now, in the story, they're in confusion. And why are they in confusion as they're traveling? There's no water. It does not have anything to do with drinking water. Baptism has nothing to do with wet water that you put your head in. You are looking at metaphysics. You are looking at the ancient religions. You are lo there are five stages of consciousness. The first is earth. The second is water. The third is air. The fourth is fire. The fifth is new life. When you take the earth, which is your head, and lift it through meditation into the second stage of consciousness, you come to water. You begin to understand truth. You then rise out of the second stage of consciousness in your meditation, and you enter the air, which is the third stage where there are no thoughts. You then rise up the air and you touch that which is the fire which is the spirit that's why in all of your life they would take you when you're a baby or take you when you get involved in a church and they'd stick your head in water and when you come out you might have had the flu or you might have got something but you got nothing as far as anything to do with God because you missed it 99 percent of the people who have been baptized have never been baptized because this is an inner struggle the earth, the mind, goes to the second stage, water. And what does it say here? They're searching in the wilderness and they could not find water. They could not find the truth. They could not understand this. The so Bible says we will rise to meet Jesus in where? In the air. And so the whole idea, the philosophies of the religions is that you're going to actually fly through the sky. No, you're not. You're going to raise yourself to the third stage of consciousness and meet that which is the Christ consciousness within yourself. When there are no thoughts, then you'll meet Christ in the air. So this is what this is all about. So a lack of water is a lack of truth. When you're struggling through the wilderness, even now, even though you've come out of the left side, even though you're heading for the right side, even though you're heading for the promised land of the right hemisphere of the brain, you still get into a point of confusion. You feel it within yourself. There is not one person sitting in this room that should not pick up this Newsweek article instantly and be meditating. There is not one person that you know that has cancer or that has some kind of serious disease. You should sit with them with that article and say, for God's sakes, look at this. And look, Jesus talked about it. Jacob talked about it. Osiris talked about it. Rene Descartes talked about it. Every, this is a scientific fact. This is what it means. You set aside time inside of yourself. And inside of your children, I don't care if your children understand it. I don't care if you understand it. What do you have to understand about the pineal gland secreting melatonin? You'll never understand it. All you have to do is know that when you sit down in the darkness, it does. Period. I do not have to understand how the television works in order to watch it. All I know is I press the little thing in my hand and pictures come on. How it happens, I haven't any idea. But it happens. And that's what we have to understand. So we seek this truth constantly. We're looking for this water. Constantly. 
<coughs> you're sitting here because you've never heard the truth. You can't just going to be the truth out there. Devils. God's going to blow the world up. God killed his son to forgive you because you ate meat fried. That's the truth. God is on our side because we won the war. We killed how many people we killed. That's the truth. And so it says in Exodus 15, where you're at, verse 23, And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah. And the reason they couldn't drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. They couldn't drink of the water because it's bitter. You can't take the truth because of the bitterness that's built up in you for years and years and years of this stuff. Loaded with bitterness. This bitterness, this mara, is depression, it's anger, it's guilt. Much of it comes from religion. Much of it comes from your society. Much of it comes from your schools. Much of it comes from your family. And the bitterness just wells up in you to the point where you can't see, you can't feel, you can't understand. What are you going to do? <laughs> see, that wakes me up every time. Let me show you something. Do you see where it says they came, the water was bitter, and they called it Mara? In Hindu, the devil is called Mara. In Hindu, the word for devil is Mara. So what is the devil? Bitterness. You see O.J. Simpson sitting there? Did the devil make him do it? Sure. Bitterness. Or whoever did it. I don't prejudge anything. But there's bitterness. And what can bitterness make you do? Bitterness can make you do anything. And if you're bitter enough, and if you're going to assault it all of your life, then you'll do anything. Maras are the lords of sexual or sensual desires. Mara is the tempter. But in the center of all this bitterness, in the center of all this bitterness, in the center of Mara, a child is born. Mara is Mary. And in the center of all of this bitterness, in the center of Mara, in the center of Mary, in the eye of the storm, there's a quiet place, and there the child is born. In the eye of the storm, the child is born. In the eye of the storm is Mara. In the eye of the storm is Mary. In the center of your head, which is screaming right now, with all of the hurt and all of the anger and all of the feelings and all of the bitterness, there's a quiet place. And you can enter into that quiet place, and there it all stops. And there that pineal gland opens, and there the melatonin flows through all parts of your body, and you begin to see things differently and you begin to feel differently, and you begin to act differently. And that's what it says that Jesus, I am in you. This is the Christ born out of the bitterness. And the source of the bitterness is thought. And the source of the bitterness is thought. You say, well, I didn't want to, th I don't want to think this way. You don't have any pro, you don't have any, look, here's you. And you're nice. But somebody's dumping in you, dumping in you, all of your life dumping in you. This is the way it is. Don't think this way. Don't do this. Don't do the other. Do this. Do that. And before you know it, bang, bang, bang. And this system's thoughts become your thoughts. This system's thoughts become your thoughts, and it becomes bitterness. And the bitterness flows, and the bitterness flows, and the bitterness flows. And what does Jesus say? Go to page 782, Matthew chapter 6. And in Matthew chapter 6, look at verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought. And look at verse 27, why do you take thought? And look at verse 28, and why do you take thought? And look at verse 31, take no thought. And look at verse 34, take no thought. He's saying, you've got to separate yourself from me. He doesn't say, don't worry. There's no way you cannot worry. But he's saying, take no thought. Separate from these thoughts. Separate from these thoughts. 
there's a plant called Artemisia absimidium or something like that, but it's called hemlock and it's also called wormwood. It means bitterness. It means bitter. It says in Proverbs 5, 4, there's a strange woman, the emotions, her end is bitter as wormwood. But then it says in Revelation, a star fell. A star fell. A light fell. There within you was a star. There within you was a good feeling. There within you was an ideal, an idea, a source of love. Something came into your life. Something dumped into you. Something changed you. Something made you feel not the way you used to feel. And the star fell. Go with me for a minute to page 1007, Revelation chapter 8. 1007, Revelation chapter 8 and verse 11. Verse 10, And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven burning as a lamp, and it fell upon a third part of the rivers and upon the mountains of waters, and the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters be called Wormwood. And many men died because they were made bitter. The third part is your physical, your emotional, your intellectual, and when your spirit is brought down, when that star falls and is brought down by that which is the ideas of your religions and your families and all of this, when that drops, this drops with it. And most people die because of bitterness. And cancer comes from bitterness, and all kinds of things can come from bitterness, and all hope goes, and you know what happens, and what's the rest. They were made bitter. So you see, when you're in the wilderness, which is in confusion, you'll come upon truth, and you think it's truth, don't you? You go to church, you never doubted anything. You pick up books, you read it, you never doubt it. Oh, you go around and show somebody, look what it says here. Looks good to me, I believe this. Where did he get the idea? I don't know. Where does the Bible come from? Nobody knows. Who wrote it? Who's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Did anybody ever tell you those people never existed? King Solomon, King David. Did anybody ever tell you there never was a King Solomon? There never was a King David? No. Did anybody ever tell you that the whole New Testament was written in Greek by Greeks in Greece? And it's Greek mythology of Plato and Pythagoras and has nothing to do with Jews and Israel? Did anybody ever tell you it's a myth? No. Well, Couldn't you ever stop for a second and say, where did all these English people come from? Where did Peter, Paul, and Mary come from winding up in Palestine? Nathaniel, Bartholomew, Philip? <laughs> did you ever know there's no, nobody born named Nathaniel, Bartholomew, Philip, Peter, Paul, and Mary that live in Israel? Never, never, never. Nobody ever questions that. Somebody made it up. But it's not made up because... Of, of a silly, it's made up because we don't understand. We don't understand allegory. We don't understand metaphysics. We don't understand myth. We don't understand symbolisms. I was telling Josie, Josie's family has a restaurant up here, Tara Tara. And a couple of weeks ago, we were in there, one of the young ladies, a sweet girl, her name was Antonina, is it, or something? Antonella, she's from Italy. And I looked up at her and I said, you know what? Let you and me go shoot the ball. What are we going to shoot ball for? Oh. To her, I meant, let's go kill an animal. She didn't know I meant, let's talk. Hey, what did we say? You shut your mouth off. What, are you going to call the first aid squad because you heard somebody shut their mouth off? <laughs> spill the beans. It's all, I going to get a broom because somebody spilled the beans? This guy's three sheets to the wind. What are you going to do about that? Is it in the backyard hanging up in your clothesline? What is this? <laughs> and you know what? You laugh because every one of those expressions, you know exactly what they mean. Why? Because you know the symbolic language of your culture. But I can tell you something, folks. You do not know the symbolic language of this culture, and that's why this is taken literally. Even though the Apostle Paul said, be not a minister of the letter. Don't take this stuff literally. It'll kill you. Do you know? Can you tell of anybody that took this stuff literally and killed himself and a lot of people recently? His name was David Koresh. And he didn't know that fire was the fourth stage of consciousness that comes down from the mind to purify away all the guilt, fear, and hurt. He thought of a literal fire because he was taught literally, and so he set the whole place on fire and feel that the will of God was fulfilled because he didn't know. There's nothing more dangerous than a born-again Christian with a gun in his hand. And so here, then, you realize 
It says in Exodus 15, 24, the people murmured against Moses because there's this bitterness. We question everything. And then inside of you, the Moses cries out, it says in verse 25, that part of the mind that cries out. And you look what it says, real quick now, because we've got we to get out of here. Page 60, Exodus chapter 15. And this is the good part. The you come to the water, you come to the lake, and it's bitter. And nobody can drink out of it. In other words, inside of yourself, there's this, this bitter. And you can't take it anymore. You can't, it's sucking your, you can't deal with life anymore. And everything is a bunch of hypocrites, a bunch of liars. So what do you do? It says in Exodus chapter 15 and verse 25, And the Lord showed him a tree. Now the word tree, metaphysically, means you. In the Kabbalah, the Sephora tree is you. You are the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You are the tree of life. You are the tree. If they were to show you an x-ray of your back, you could see all the nerves and they spread out in your body like a tree. And what does it say to do? Take the tree and put the tree in the water. Take yourself and put yourself in the second stage of consciousness in the meditation. And you sit there and as those electrical resistance goes up the resistors, you chant the, you chant the international word of electrical resistance and you chant, oh. See, you thought these people were crazy Buddhists up in Tibet something. You didn't know that they were talking electricity and electrical energy when they were saying, Om, Om, and it would light one chakra, one nerve center, one resistor after the other until it finally hit that pineal gland that sends forth the melatonin. Put yourself in meditation. Put yourself in the water, in the second stage of consciousness, and it says here, and the bitter water will turn sweet. The bitterness will go away. The thoughts will go away. Well, I'm not saying you won't come back. And you go back, but the bitterness will go away. Isn't that great? Cast it into the water, the waters were made sweet. And there he made for them an ordinance. And he said, if you'll listen to me, and if you'll do what is right, I will look at verse 26. Talk about melatonin? We're talking about the pineal gland? We're talking about what we're talking about? What it says, going to heal all of these diseases, it says in Newsweek magazine? It says here, look at verse 26. Look, at, if you'll listen to what I say, you'll do it right, I will put none of these diseases upon you, which I have brought upon you. I won't give you any of that. What does it take? Is it so damn hard to give up the couch for a couple of hours? Is it so hard to turn the lights off? Go and do it in your... Is it so hard to start paying attention to yourself? It doesn't cost you any money. You don't have to join any church. You don't have to become involved in anything. All you have to do is start obeying the wisdom of the ancients, the directions of nature, the directions of God. Look within yourself. Let the darkness close in within you. Let the melatonin begin to flow. And the bitterness will go away. And the bitter waters will become sweet. Now I got other stuff, but I don't know, I got carried away. It doesn't make any difference. And you know what? Let me just tell you something. So no, no, they, they say, I love the Lord. And Jesus said, look, if your eye be single, your body will fill with light. If you stimulate the pineal gland, your body will fill with melatonin. And Jesus said, if you want to catch fish, if you want to have wisdom, fish is brain food. If you want to know, cast your net to the right side. Hey! That means energize the right side. That's what Jesus said. And Jesus said in Luke 11, 52, you take away the key of knowledge because you don't enter with it. You know, I don't want to tell you, but I want you to see that because some of you have never seen it. Tell me what page that's on. Luke 11, what page is that on? I want these people to see that. Luke 11, hurry. What page is that on? What is it? Eight, go to page 846. Real quick. Luke chapter 11. Okay. He's talking to the lawyers. Lawyers are people who write the Bible. What does he say? What does it say? You take away the key. Luke, Luke 11, chapter 46. Wait a minute, have I got the right? right yeah, Luke 11, 52, I'm sorry. Luke 11, 52. Woe unto you lawyers, and those are the people who give the law of the Bible. You have taken away the key of knowledge. 
you entered not in yourselves. I didn't say that. A new age preacher didn't say that. Jesus said that. There's the key of knowledge. It has nothing to do with going to church. It has nothing to do with becoming religious. It has nothing to do with reading the Bible. It has to do with entering within yourself. And you hinder those who are entering it. So we meditate. The bitter becomes sweet. And now we'll just go into where we're going to be next week as we continue this. Go to page 60, Exodus chapter 15. And look at the difference. They threw the tree in the water. You place yourself in the second stage of consciousness, which is the truth. And in Exodus chapter 15, okay, where you are, in Exodus chapter 15 and verse 27, it says, and they came to Elim. Elim means trees. And there were 12 wells of water. Perfection! The 12 signs of the zodiac the encompassing power of nature and the universe. And there were three score and ten palm trees. Three score is three times twenty equals sixty, plus ten equals seventy. And the number seven means divine intervention. The seven chakras. The seven nerve centers that ride up your spine. You think what I'm talking about? I promise you this is the last thing I say. Go to Revelation chapter five. Tell me which page it's on. You can read it with me. I'll give you the Hindu Kundalini. I'll give you what Newsweek magazine is talking about. I'll give you it in the Bible. And that's why people there don't like me. Because that's not that I'm using crazy books. I'm not using screwy books and screwy stories. I'm not throwing smoke and, and stones. I'm giving you it in the Bible. Do you want to see the Hindu Kundalini? Do you want to see the essence that rises up your spine, goes through seven nerve centers, impacts the pineal gland, and throws open the right hemisphere of the brain in the Bible? Revelation chapter 5. It's on page 1005. <clears throat> 1005, Revelation chapter 5. You there? I want everybody to see it. You there? Mm -hmm. yes. And I saw, you see chapter 5 verse 1, and I saw in the right hand, which signifies the right hemisphere of the brain, of him who sat on the throne, which is the highest consciousness, a book. That's the book of life. Remember when you were a kid in your religious school, you said you've got to have your name written in the book of life? This is how it happens. A book written where? Within and where? And on the backside and sealed with seven seals. How do I know? The Bible tells me so. So they come to Elam. That's good. They come to Elam and there's and what happened? We have come and we have found the perfect truth. Oh. Are there going to be more snipers? Oh, this is great. As they go across Exodus, there's people sniping at them all over the place. Doesn't make any difference how much you meditate. There'll always be a sniper. There'll always be a snake in the woodpile. There'll always be somebody sniping at you, somebody trying to beat you. But you're going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And even to the point where you get near the promised land, people are going to tell you, oh, don't go near that place. Don't go near that church because there's demons and devils within you. And it says they sent out spies and some of the spies come back and said, oh, they got giants. We don't want to go near them. And Joshua said, the hell with you. I'm going anyhow. Pow, he went. And they crossed the Jordan and they made it to the promised land. Where did they come? They came from here all the way over to here. Do you know what has happened in your life? You know what has happened in my life because of religion? The people that were over here, we had religion, we have Christianity, we have Buddhism, we have Hinduism, we have Muslim. You know what we've got? Zip right back here. We've made a journey the opposite direction. We've come from here, which is 90% of your brain. 90% is dormant. 10% you use because we gave it all up. And so with the Bible itself says, I want you to tithe. I want you to give 10%. It's not talking about 10% of your money. It's saying, I want you to give the 10% that you use. If you give me the 10% that you use, I'll give you the 90% that I use. Shut it down. Meditate. And allow the melatonin to flow. Allow the pineal to explode. New life, new seed into your body and into your mind and into your soul. And we'll continue with the exodus now that we've come to Elam, across the mountains to the promised land. <sighs> My bad. Thank you.